My hair is just getting bigger as I'm sitting here. <laughs> Send help. Hi guys, welcome back to another episode of Crew Time. Crew Time. Crew Time. <laughs> what am I doing? If you are new here, Hello, my name is Sarah and what I do here is tell you a terrible story to ruin your day and put on my makeup at the same time. So if you are into that combination, you are in the right place. So make sure you subscribe to this channel and hit the bell notification alerts, all those things so you never miss one of my terrible stories. Today's story comes from the only state in the union that does not have counties. The political subdivisions there are called parishes. Did I just give it away? It's the birthplace of jazz and the home of the Mardi Gras festival. Listen, every fun fact that I looked up for this state just gives it away immediately, okay? This is Louisiana. Today's story was recommended by a viewer on Instagram. Everybody say hi to Callie. Hi Callie. You guys always come through with the craziest stories and this one is a lot. So thank you, Callie. This is the story of the Katrina couple. Okay, so this story, although there's a lot in it, I'm not really sure how long this is gonna be. I'll do my best to stretch it out because I know you guys like longer videos. <laughs> also, I don't really talk about or specifically show the products that I'm using while I'm putting my face on today. So if you're interested to know what I'm using, just look in the description box because everything is linked. There's also another feature that's pretty new. I don't know if it shows up on mobile, but it's definitely on, you know, regular computer desktop. Computer computer desktop. Sound like a grandma. Anyways, there's like a little picture of the item and you can click on it if you're interested to learn more about it. Okay, let's get into it. On the evening of October 17th, 2006, the New Orleans police responded to a report of an apparent suicide. A man had jumped off of the Omni Royal Orleans Hotel's rooftop bar and he fell seven stories to his death, having landed on top of a parking garage. The man was 28-year-old Zach Bowen. So inside the back pocket of his pants was a plastic bag with his suicide note. They also found a key and his army dog tags. And the note they found read in part, quote, this is not accidental. I had to take my own life to pay for the one I took. If you send a patrol car to 826 North Rampart, you will find the dismembered corpse of my girlfriend Addie in the oven on the stove and in the fridge and a full signed confession from myself. The keys in my right front pocket are for the gates. Call Leo Watermeyer to let you in. Zach Bowen. What? Ha! What? 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 Hold on to your butts. You guys, we're coming in hot today. Okay, so when police arrived at the French Quarter apartment, which was interestingly located above the voodoo spiritual temple. The air conditioning was blasting. It had been set to 60 degrees and there were messages spray painted on the walls. One of those messages read, I am a total failure. There was also an arrow spray painted on the front of the stove. And on the top of the stove were two large cooking pots containing a head, hands, and feet. Inside the oven was a baking tray, baking sheet, and on top of it were arms and legs. They reportedly had been seasoned. <laughs> on the counter next to the stove were cut up potatoes and carrots. Inside the refrigerator was a trash bag containing the remainder of the person. They also discovered a journal containing the eight page confession written by Zach. It described both his feelings about Addie's murder and what happened in the two weeks leading up from killing her and then killing himself. So how did we get here? I'm glad you asked. Zachary Zach Bowen was born on May 15th, 1978 in Bakersfield, California. His upbringing, childhood upbringing was, you know, pretty normal, just average American kid. His family moved around a bit, you know, spending time in Seattle for a while, but so Zach's parents, their marriage wasn't, you know, awesome. <laughs> I don't have a whole ton of information about his dad, but from what I understand, he was, you know, kind of an irresponsible type of a guy. So Zach's parents divorced when he was younger in 1990. He lived with his mom, Lori, in Sacramento, where he went to school. Once he got into high school years, 
he started to really struggle with depression. So Zach did whatever he could to overcome this depression and seeking a fresh start, he decided to move to Seattle to live with his dad. Okay, so sometime after moving to Seattle, he and his dad took a road trip that took them to New Orleans. Well, he must have just really been taken with the city because at age 17, he decided he wanted to stay and live there. Again, Zach's dad was kind of a mess, you know, so he agreed that this was a great plan. So at age 17, you know, Zach was on his own in New Orleans. His dad had moved back to Seattle and just left him there. Okay. Well, shocker, Zach did not finish high school. That didn't work out. So Zach was very tall, by the way, almost like seven feet tall. <laughs> he was really good looking and charming and he easily passed as much older than he really was. He soon started bartending to support himself and he soon met 28 year old Lana Shupak. Lana and Zach pretty soon learned that they were expecting a baby boy and they got married. After their second child was born, a daughter, Zach decided that he wanted to enlist in the army to provide, you know, more financial stability for their family. So he did just that in May of 2000. So Zach worked as a military police officer and he served deployments in both Kosovo and Iraq. I'm gonna have to do brows off camera today, sorry. <laughs> okay, so. Zach, where was I? Zach struggled with drug and alcohol abuse. He had severe PTS, post-traumatic stress, from what he witnessed when he was deployed in Iraq. So remember, he joined the army like right before 9-11. So a lot of the action he saw in his deployments was in the very early stages of the conflict. So pretty intense. Anyways, while in Baghdad with the 527th military police company, Zach witnessed the death of a close friend and fellow soldier named Rachel Bosveld. She was killed during a mortar attack. He also witnessed the death of a young Iraqi child that he'd befriended. Insurgents blew up the family's shop, killing all of them. It's unfortunately quite common for war veterans, um, especially those with PTS. And the statistics say that one in four suffer some kind of service-connected mental health condition. Well, it's unfortunately quite common for them to fall into addiction. It's an easy way to quiet the noise and disassociate the infinite loop of their life replaying over and over and over in their mind. Zach also developed a problem with his feet. I don't know if it was bunions, uh, plantar fasciitis, whatever it is. He had a problem with his feet and it deteriorated quickly. And it also exacerbated his disgruntled state of mind with the army. He began to purposefully fail his fitness tests and he eventually separated from the army and he received a general discharge. So a general discharge I have found, it typically comes after some kind of misconduct like Zach's malingering. Well, the general discharge disqualifies a person from further like veterans benefits, like health benefits. Zach and Lana's marriage had also dissolved by this time, but with two children to support, he decided he needed to return to bartending in New Orleans. Adrian Addie Hall grew up in North Carolina. She was a spitfire, you know, free-spirited bohemian type, and she was a talented artist who wrote poetry and taught dance classes, and she tended bar to pay the bills. She was totally immersed in the local community, and she was often seen cruising around the French Quarter on her bicycle. Well, Addie's upbringing, her childhood wasn't great. She had suffered sexual abuse at a very young age, and she fell into a pattern of abusive relationships as an adult. Addie also reportedly suffered from bipolar disorder, was also a very heavy drinker, you know, probably self-medicating. And not only was she a heavy drinker, she was a mean drunk. So Zach and Addie met at Matusa's Market where they both worked for a time in the summer of 2005. They were charmed by each other and instantly clicked. Now their relationship was wild, wild and intense. It was passionate, it was very tumultuous. They were hard partiers, you know, doing drugs and drinking together a lot. Well, in the late summer, early fall of 2005, Hurricane Katrina was looming off of the Gulf Coast of the United States. As dawn breaks, Katrina's wind speeds slow back down to a Category 4 hurricane. It makes landfall at 6 a.m., 
60 miles southeast of New Orleans. Now, I remember this time vividly because Hurricane Katrina hit over my birthday weekend. Poor me. Do you guys remember how terrible it was? All that flooding and oh, just, just devastating. Hurricane Katrina, if you recall, was a category five storm and it resulted in the fatalities of over 1,800 people and it caused 125 billion dollars worth of damage. Also, do you guys remember the, the telethon with all the celebrities to raise money for the relief efforts? George Bush doesn't care about black people. Okay, anyways, so with the threat of the storm increasing, Addie invited Zach to ride out the storm with her in her apartment. Well, Hurricane Katrina straight up ravaged the city, and Zach and Addie refused to evacuate, despite the mandatory order from the governor. Zach's ex-wife, Lana, you know, of course she had custody of the kids, she asked him to come with her, you know, to make sure that he was safe, even saying that Addie could come along too. Well, once the storm passed, Nearly everything was closed or destroyed, but the French Quarter was largely unscathed. Zach and Addie just really embraced this time. You know, they had no job, no bills, no responsibilities. They, they treated it more like a camping trip, less like a disaster. There was no running water, no electricity, very, very limited resources, and they loved it. They spent their days feeding stray cats and they would go into the abandoned, you know, closed bars and take the alcohol and mix up cocktails for neighbors and people passing through. In the evenings, they would cook food over bonfires that they had lit from storm debris and they would play music and they would enjoy the stars together because the lights in the city were out. Little Miss Addie was also known to flash her boobs whenever police would make the rounds. The true, true Nolan's ball and raise experience. experience. Zach and Addie were known as the king and queen of the Katrina survivalists, and they were even featured in a article in the New York Times. Well, this went on for nearly a year, and it was a very romantic time for Zach and Addie until it wasn't. Well, as I mentioned, they argued a lot. When the city started to rebuild and their friends started returning to normal life, Zach and Addie went back to arguing. I mean, not that they had ever really stopped. You know what I mean? They would break up, get back together, break up, get back together, you know? They were also using an extraordinary amount of cocaine during this time. Addie was a mean drunk and would also get physical with Zach during their fights. <sighs> Okay, so yes, they did break up and get back together a lot, and the last time that they got back together, they decided to move into a new apartment. You know, kind of, I guess, start fresh. So sure, they're in a new place, but like, the relationship was the same old story, you know? Everything was getting way out of hand. Well, the final straw came when Addie asked the landlord to remove Zach from the lease. And they had just moved in together. I also read that Zach was the one who paid like the deposits and it just seemed like a kind of an underhanded trick, you know, to let him pay for the deposits and then kick him out. I'm not saying that that justifies anything, but facts. Well, the reason she did this was she was convinced that Zach had cheated on her. Everything was just unraveling. So around 1 a.m. on October 5th, 2006, a very intoxicated Zach, in his words, very calmly strangled Addie to death. Also in my research, I found some suggestions of necrophilia, but an article with the police chief that handled this case strongly denied that claim. Okay, so according to the handwritten confession, in the days following the murder of Addie, Zach went back to work. He was delivering groceries at the time. He took the rest of whatever money was left, and it was about $1,500 in cash, and he decided to spend it. He went out to restaurants. He visited some gentlemen's clubs. He bought lots and lots of drugs. <laughs> So he was planning to enjoy his remaining days because he knew it had to end. So there's a dead body in the apartment, but he has to deal with it, right? So when he returned home from work, he took Addie's body to the bathtub and used a knife and a hacksaw to cut her into manageable pieces. Four days went by with Zach in this horrific scene and his friends would later tell investigators that he seemed 
in good spirits, and was even happy during this time. When friends would ask, where's Addie? Zach told him that, you know, they'd gotten into it and she decided to go home to North Carolina for a while. And that checked out because, you know, Addie could be pretty unpredictable. All right, so he has cut Addie up and meticulously cleaned the bathroom. It then took him about four days to figure out what was he gonna do with these body parts. So his plan was to cook them to make it easier to separate, you know, from the bone and then dispose of the bits like it was like regular leftovers. In the confession, in the journal, Zach wrote, quote, halfway through the task, I stopped and thought about what I was doing. The decision to halt the first idea and move to plan B, the crime scene that you're in right now, came after a while. I scared myself not only by the action of calmly strangling the woman that I've loved for one and a half years, but my entire lack of remorse. I've known forever how horrible a person I am, ask anyone. So 12 days after Addie was killed, the security cameras at the Royal Orleans Hotel showed that Zach approached the terrace several times looking over it. Finally, he chugged a drink at the bar and then threw himself over the ledge to his death. When Zach's body was examined, he had 28 cigarette burns on it. So the confession that Zach left behind explained that the burns were meant to mark the failures in his life. You know, um, school, jobs, military, family, parenting, love. There was one burn for each year of his life. Although some of Addie's remains, most of Addie's remains had been cooked, strongly suggesting cannibalism, there was nothing found in Zach's digestive system that would indicate that he ate. So the storefront underneath the apartment on North Rampart Street is now the Bloody Mary New Orleans Haunted Museum. For a fee, you can even tour the apartment and see the actual stove and refrigerator where Addie's remains were discovered. If you're into that kind of thing. Friends of Zach and Addie are actually very disgusted by this. You know, they say it's despicable and atrociously exploitive. But the owner of the museum, Mary Millian, Millian? Millian? Um, she is a self-described voodoo priestess. Well, she disagrees, saying that it's meant to be a tribute to their spirits and also to educate the public about them and what happened to them. She claims to also have made donations to the New Orleans Family Justice Center's efforts to combat domestic violence. Some people say that the influence of voodoo and all that sort of thing could have influenced Zach's behavior. And some people also claim that the apartment is haunted, also why it's on the ghost tour, but that's up to you. What I'm saying is that the combination of drugs, alcohol, and untreated mental illness is a toxic combination that resulted in a sad and very preventable tragedy. And that, friends, is the story of the Katrina couple, Zach Bowen and Addie Hall. Thanks again to Callie for the terrible story recommendation. I appreciate you. If you have a crew crime story that you would like to recommend, check down in the description box. There is a Google Doc for you to complete. You can leave as many details or as little details as you want, but I very much appreciate all of your recommendations because you guys have some crazy stories to tell and I'm into it. Again, if you're interested in any of the makeup that I used today, everything is linked down below, including coupon codes and some other fun stuff. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you want to see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here on YouTube every week and you can follow me on the other socials as well. That is it for now. I will catch you next time in the next video. Bye! So Lana and Ze- Lana- Oh, that's really dark. Oh no. And I'm really putting it on heavy today. Huh. Atrocious- atro atro Atrofish. <laughs> Green on the top, purple on the bottom. This is a very bold look today. Oh, the fucking air's on. Hold please. Consider scribe. Consider scribing to this channel. <laughs>